challenging and asking questions because he has an enormous amount of knowledge, good sense of humor, and you should ask him to cook frijoles. <laughs> because he's the best cook. <laughs> Thank you. Also, I have uh, taken Eduardo's work to China, and it's just um, an image that's reproduced in a catalog from Bogota, Colombia, where I talked about your work at Fotografica last year. So, um, you're lucky to be working with Eduardo. Thank you. Sir. How many of you want to be photographers? <laughs> a lot. Yes. Good. Uh, we, any, you're ex, you're very lucky also to um, have Irina Chemayerva, the principal Russian curator of the exhibitions here, to um, lead you through it. I know a lot in a kind of overview way, um, and with some photographers deeply. But I don't have Edina's knowledge. Um, and but one I don't know American photography no, and the I don't. photography <laughs> and <your skill. laughs> No, that's true. <laughs> uh, but one of the important things, and I think we will have the chance to see another show alongside this, um, is that the selections of these exhibitions don't, don't, are, don't all, only reflect good photography and provocative and serious photography. It doesn't always mean with this generation that in a sense they are artists who have achieved a certain uh, coherence of work. They're still working it out, they're still developing. But it reflects in a very important way what's happening in their country and what has happened in their country since um, the end of the Stalinist period the early 50s, and I won't go into that history because I hope Nina will mention it, and Eduardo may have talked with you about it, but um, probably none of you, and certainly not my very few people in the United States, um, have experienced what Soviet Union and Russia experienced in this century, um, both with two world wars, their own revolution, um, and a very deep and powerful period of repression under Stalin, but also under the 20 years of leadership that followed him. It was less severe than Stalin, but still it was on again, off again, censorship, trials, and so forth, where it was very, very difficult for people to have any direct knowledge of what was happening outside their own country and in the rest of the world, and even in their own past, um, at a time when there was more freedom and so forth. So the idea of this it, whole series of exhibitions from the late 1950s through the present uh, is to show not only a very important part of photographic history, much of which actually has been forgotten because of political and economic turmoils, but also um, the voice of the young generation today. So um, I hope Eduardo has told you a little about, about PhotoFest. I'm not gonna tell you very much about that now, except that it's a nonprofit organization. It's um, devoted to the best of photography, to creating opportunities for people um, from all over the world and to create international exchange in a way that wasn't done when we started in the late 80s. And we also have a school program that uses photography to increase writing and visual literacy. Not to make more photographers, but to actually use the image as a way of stimulating personal expression. So with that, I will ask Edina. You may have to move closer because Marina has it quite sounds a softer quiet. voice. Mm -hmm. that voice. Uh, we have a very long time relations with Wendy and Fred. And uh, thanks to them, in 2002, we had a big exhibition of Russian pictorialism here at Photofest. And it was for the first time in 70 years when the Russian pictorialism was part of the whole movement of pictorialism in the beginning of the 
something different because uh, China is one of the main civilization power of our time. Russia is not in this position right now. It's lost empire. It's fallen empire. And how we decided to make it. Yesterday we had the uh, talk of curators for public at meeting place and we explained that maybe culture is the only thing what we are not ashamed to represent all over the world. And it's, it's really that power that Russians can be on our world. And uh, we had for the first, first suggestion to make a big exhibition of last 30 years of history. From Perestroika to our time. Because in Perestroika it was the end of 1980s. It was a real flash in Russia. It was perestroika for economy, for society life, uh, for social life, and uh, for the social life, the second very important thing was glasnost. The independence of media and uh, less censorship than it was in Soviet time. And in that period, a lot of foreigners came into Russia was the falling of Iron Curtain. It was the falling of Berlin Wall. It was time of rediscover of Russia after Soviet Union. Because Soviet Union fell down in 1992, and since that time, we're talking about contemporary new Russia, separate countries like Belarus, Ukraine, but it's still more or less one culture. Of course, with a national identity, all the countries, but the basement of last century is the same for all the states. And the idea was to present these 30 years since the historic time nowadays. But then, young generation, something different. Because people who came in the last seven years, uh, many of them less than 30. Nikita Pirabu, for example, is 23. And he was the youngest last year in Moscow when uh, we uh, organized a big, the first real international portfolio review for Russian, Ukrainian, and Belarusian photographers with Fred and Wendy. They invited 45 curators all over the world. We had people from 18 countries, directors of museums, collectors, publishers, curators of photography, was again rediscovered of new photography. For many years we had a kind of photography life. It was and it is a big biennial of photography in Moscow, but it focused on foreign photography. Because uh, this festival is a kind of entertainment for the rich people. They like to come for tales, they like to spend time there, but uh, it's not about there are no educational programs, lectures, or portfolio review within the festival. 
that's why when we arranged uh, this portfolio review in last August, we had 3,000 applications. And also it was because it was not free. Many of the people didn't realize what does it mean portfolio review. They realized it's something like in school. You have portfolio review with your teachers. Sometimes you have a chance to show your portfolios to all the photographers, to hear their advices and it's all. But portfolio review in professional society is different. It's one of the steps in your career when you can follow the hierarchy of photography. And in the same time, you're going by lucky chance to the top level from the very beginning. You can be a student, you are involved in portfolio review, and you have a chance to talk to curator of big museum. And if you're interested, you have the immediate reply and uh, the result. And it's, of course, it's a big game. But it's a game with exact and very positive rules and with an ethical basement of relations with photographers. Because at Portfolio Review, they are the brave people and they are supported by the authors. And when we did it in Moscow, we had just 185 places for photographers for days of talks with. 45 foreign curators. And <coughs> among this big group of Russian, Belarusian, and Ukrainian photographers, they had a lot of young people. The gate was some people very old, 50, 60, 80. And we had people around 20. And they were equal because they are professionals. And for many of them, nevertheless, about 80. It was the first time in their life. And after portfolio review in Moscow, we decided to make young generation and we knew for sure the names, what we would like to represent. So it's right now 23 names. Only one we check from different portfolio review. All the other parts of Moscow portfolio review was here. And what for us was the difference? from the people from Perestroy, because more or less they are alive today, young, older, what's the difference? Of course, it's not the only age, but there are people who were born in Perestroy at the time and had a very different childhood experience. People didn't know anything about Soviet Russia, they had no such happy childhood as people had in Soviet time, after Stalin, in Khrushchev, Brezhnev, even in Gorbachev time, because family felt themselves uh, protected by state. So it was a kind of calm atmosphere in uh, the personal life. It was more connected with the real uh, social and political younger brothers and sisters, how they operate with uh, iPhones and iPads. It's just one touch of the screen and they knew how to do it. And the same for you in photography in digital field. 
So this generation starts to work with digital photography, with video, with mixed media, in really different level than the previous generations. Maybe not too much experience. I hope today we will have time and chance to visit another exhibition of the older generation. And you will see how much experiments were there, even without any digital tools. But to work in digital time, it's it's different kind of mentality. What we try to express here as well. Plus, uh, it's internet. So it's information from everywhere. It's not just personal connections. For many time, for many years in Russia, were no real photography education. There are no still departments of photography in universities or in art institutes. People can apply for journalism and photo reportage in uh, schools of journalism, or they uh, have to go to private schools. And of course, private school, it's, it's something very subjective. Teachers can be good, can be different, but it's, uh, it's not relevant in a world system of education. In every case, people know much less than they can. But by internet, they collect a lot of new information. And it's also that way what these people use to self-teach themselves. And also, what's about time? But where is the life of society? But that is an answer. Society in the last 10 years has a very different new period. We have a Mr. Putin, nevertheless was a president or prime minister, and now here again will be president. It's a kind of a soft de democracy operated dictatorship of new time. And uh, the political life is very separated from the society. Society tried to manifest their own opinion this winter. But elections show that it doesn't matter what people really think, what they say. And in this case, all of these young people are very isolated from the social activity and from the social life. Even the photojournalists, they focused on a life of real people. And they tried to cover that kind of life what's not covered by official means. And right now, I just will uh, mention a few collections among 23. And then we will have a little bit, I hope, more time to look around and then run to Spring Studios, to that exhibition. Yes? Yeah. Okay. I, I want to ask them something. Do yeah. you want to go to the next exhibition? Do you want to have your profile? Till the beginning of Perestroika. And we decided to show what was the photography before. Because everything that was rediscovered in Perestroika time had kind of base, basement. What teachers, what all the people who taught, who showed, who really supported young people, what they were. And at that exhibition in Williams Tower, there were kind of two halls, Western and Eastern. And in Western Hall were the elevators or escalators. Uh, there is uh, official part and earlier photography, 50s, 60s, in very good big prints, how it was presented at the official exhibitions. The same photography as was uh, published in illustrated magazines. And in the Eastern Gallery, there are photos by amateurs. But they were amateurs just because it was no system for fine art photography. It was only the official photography and a kind of entertainment for workers, engineers, and students. So so but in that photo clubs, people really did new photography. It was not a kind of avant-garde like Russia had in the 20s. 
was not so many big names, but a lot of experiments are really relevant still when you check the dates and the captions. You can realize that it's impossible. It was done in the early 70s, but it's still interesting and it's still actual for the photography. So that's the exhibition. Uh, another show is at Winter Studios and Spring Studios. At Winter Studios, we put mostly documentary photography and conceptual photography, both with documentary. Topic of memory, personal archives, a work with the documentation of the real life, also not covered by official uh, media, even in pictures. Plus some projects around the fiction and non-fiction and some conceptual installations. It's a bit. And at Spring Studios, there are about 40 names, and it's a kind of big project <coughs> about the experiments of perestroika in Pittsburgh. And what's about these young people? Well, uh, these people are from different cities and from very different social groups. And it's also the representation of subcultures which exist inside Russia. And it's representation of new riches, poor people, people in the villages. So it's, uh, it's uh, nevertheless that it's not very active as a social critic. It's uh, covered the real social context. And for example, these works by Sklodman, they were done as a new official portrait. But she didn't uh, make portraits of adults. She applied very young children. Because this young lady, she was born in Germany, and she has a European education. And when she came to Russia, she even being from wealthy family, was very shocked of a new style of riches in Russia, when children very often live separate. They have their own house, own nurse, own staffs, drivers, bodyguards. Once I had uh, an experience to see and hear young boy who uh, flight from London after kind of kindergarten in Cambridge, it was not even to school, to visit his papa in Moscow. Uh, and this boy explained to his uh, neighbor, young lady, how often he had a chance to be shot. I felt myself uh, like in fairy tales or in some fantastic film because for the people of middle class that's from the films but it's not from reality but for the people it's that kind of life so. and these children staged their portraits constructed their portraits for the photographer they decided where they will be shown, what dress, what kind of details express themselves will be in the portrait. And it's interesting because it also has a dialogue with the history of art in Russia, with the painting, with the tradition of uh, official portraits of Tsar and of noble people. 18th and 19th century, and it's interesting a kind of cultural, culturological research done by Anis Gladman. This project by Nikita Piragov, he has two sides. The video, 
with slow motion and this line of the interest. And this line of the interest, it's a visual code. Not what is uh, this line for himself. He may be separate images for maybe five years. And last two years, he uh, started to work as an artist. And he has a very early success. And I can speak to you frankly, it's very hard for him. Because to be 23 and to decide to walk or do not walk with the gallery, what's your addition to accept invitation for the festival or continue to work for your projects, it's really hard. Plus, he, had, uh, he was educated as an actor and uh, stage director for the theater. And plus he's a poet. And everything in very young age. And then come into photography and had a success in this new field and uh, realized in process of work, how to work, to study during the process. But I think his uh, proposal for this festival is very important, as for him, as for the festival, because it's the only presentation in a new kind of uh, work with photography. What is exist in Russia, but uh, just in a few spaces. It's not very traditional and it's not ordinary. And he combined images, what he did, uh, in a village, in uh, uh, suburbs, with images from his native city, St. Petersburg, uh, with portraits of his friends, and with studies of theater in nature. Some pieces of performances and details of performances are also involved into this project. And it's a construction of uh, memory, construction of uh, the mentality of young artists, what he's writing, and also to build a space for the dialogue. His project named The Other Shore, the he, uh, artist applies another person, his one shore, another person is a shore, is another side, and he built this space in between of these two shores, the space for the dialogue of the meeting. The first uh, collection in that area is done by Margot Ocherenko. Right now, he is one of the most famous young artists in Russia. She studied in uh, Moscow, she studied in Italy, in the uh, Fabrica of Benetton. And uh, she did the stories in portraits, the stories of her fellows, friends, uh, even the members of the family, but all her uh, portraits are very anonymic. It's not Dasha or Katya or Ivan. That's just kind of models, beautiful images of young beauty. And when I talked to her, I asked what you will do the next, because your, mod your models start to be older. And will you look for the beauty for all your life or what you will do? And she told me, I'm mostly interested in psychological condition of the persons. And in case I know these people, I will follow them. I will try to find this beauty, even if the faces, the bodies will be changed. And I would like to develop this beauty from the reality. Uh, in that corridor, there are some panoramas, and uh, it's a funny story of the artist and musician about his friends who are single. They are not, not monks, but they decided for the period of their life to live separately, without parents, without girlfriends, boyfriends, and they just celebrate this period of life. And it's interesting because it's very new for Russian society. It's one of the very traditional societies in Europe. Big family, 
big respect to all the generation. Uh, support of children. It's a bad parents if they will not support their children till their pension. The pension is about 60 years old. <laughs> And upstairs, uh, there are stories uh, in uh, black frames in that area uh, from neo-Gothic culture. What does it mean, neo-Goth? I think you know. It's people who are involved very much to the history of Middle Ages, to so romantic stories and to search of the death in philosophy, in the history of culture. They have a special black costumes black lips of the girls, black hairs, and so on. But at the same time, these people, are, some of them very knowledgeable. Some stories are after the ancient Philippines, and then a lot of photo reportage, and I try to describe in the short wall text why the stories were done. So let's work what was possible to speak to you in such a short time, very briefly. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you so much, Irina. Do you want to go to spring or do you want to go to Thank you very much, sir. I find it beautiful. I, uh, you know, I agree more with 
not only beautiful, but full of energy yeah. and, and full of emotion. Yeah, even a positive and vital thing. Right, yes, yes. Because if you think of Dostoevsky, Dostoevsky was more like positive in a way, but Dostoevsky, yes. right. I find he starts such a like a waffle life. Yes, absolutely. And like a faithful life. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, and go go. And everybody, all the, all the writers. So, yeah. yeah. Now and the where musicians. that comes from, I have no idea. How do you explain for Exactly. Yeah. Or even just the COVID. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, um, that's why, so I was curious about how it strikes you, this work, by people like you are the little bit. Yeah. I feel like there's a, some sense that they're wanting to get out and communicate with the rest of the world, but things are, you know, there's things that we share. Because I feel like a lot of, uh, especially a lot of us here in the U.S. just really have no idea what the kind of things that they experience are and they want to show us so, you know, if they can relate quite a bit, quite a bit about it. But, I feel like that they also are struggling because it, they just, uh, like they're, uh, I she was talking earlier about, you know, they're not really, really getting too much uh, education as far as photography wise goes, that you know, they don't know how exactly to make a really great photograph right off the bat. You know, they have to do a lot more self reflection and spend a lot more of their own time studying that words we just pay for an education and don't get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's a lot easier. Yeah. And I feel like in a lot of ways they by sitting there and trying to learn all of this on their own, they might have uh, they they might give them a little more time or they might take a little more time to reflect on because we just go and we say, this is a lecture in the side book, this kind of trial and error until we start getting it down more correctly, whereas um, then they might, you know, they're not quite as fortunate to have somebody teach them that they can't exactly understand what they're doing wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I think it, they spend a lot more time than some of the school. Yeah, I mean, Yeah. 
I was like, actually, yeah. but, um, you know, Irina will say it, which had the experience of not having any access to it, and then suddenly having this, every, all the doors open, they could go back to their own past, they could see what the United States was doing, and, you know, they could see what France and England and, and Asian photographers were doing, or art, it's not just photography, it's art, They wanted to create a 
sense of a country and a sense of a culture that was happy, healthy, and if you were a worker or a soldier uh, or a farmer, you wrote it. You look at it. What's the angle? What's the angle of? What's the position of the camera? Of the photographer? So it makes the subject the predominant element in, in these. Um, and these are this, uh, these are what the magazines, particularly in the second period of Stalin's repression after World War II, where the country lost how many people? Twenty million. Twenty million. Twenty million people. They had already lost twenty million when. Stalin collectivized agriculture in the 30s. There was, by the time 1950 arrives, you have a country that's been completely torn about by World War II. You've got agriculture that's basically dysfunctional. And you've got a country that in 15 years lost 45 million people. But this is what they wanted to make you think the country was about. <laughs> that was and that lasts for many years. So that's why it's ultimately very important to, I think, deeply understand photography. Because unlike, I mean, unlike painting and unlike many other art forms, it has this kind of public life that has given it a very particular uh, form of understanding or perceived understanding that's often very not very very much not the case often and, but it's used that way all the time and of course it's used that way in advertising um, and during the Vietnam War I've watched the Iraqi and Afghanistan war work I mean what you know lots not pub uh, publish, uh, published these days because of this because this print mechanisms are can't compete with the internet. But during the Vietnam War, um, for a very long time, you really couldn't see the reality of the war on the battlefield. Um, and it was what, in the early years, there were some people in television, there were one or two photographers who were trying to show that. And um, after a while, the work was simply not republished. Anymore. Because why does the country, does the state wanted us to believe that the war was a just war and the, and, and, and the results were positive, which of course now we know they weren't. So, yeah. Um, I really love the stark kind of natural beauty of the show and how everything sort of connects to each other, even though they're from different artists and just the inclusion of nature and kind of natural lighting and you know, the subjects without makeup and just, you know, and they're the focus of the photograph and it all kind of works together and, you know, even the children, they're in their own surroundings, but it's almost like they don't fit there, you know, yeah. Um, but yeah, I just love how it all connects and just like the real natural, isolated beauty of everything. Um, and I kind of got into photography as just a way to, to document things. Um, I love being able to look back and see what things used to look like or what memories, you know, the way I have it in my mind and the way it actually looks. Um, and so I kind of use that now to, like, just document things. Um, and I, I do a lot of street photography, and what I love is kind of just the chaos of everything that's happening, of all the people, and there's so much that you can't, you can't possibly look at everything at once, and so I, I like to take pictures of that, and then when I develop pictures, I can come back and see all the different things, like how they align and kind of what's happening all at one time that we can't really, you know, focus on at once. Mm -hmm. So, that's what I like yeah.
but you're able to manipulate and uh, control certain objects and the lighting and color, even post uh, photographing and all the editing. You're able to manipulate so much uh, to create uh, like commercial and uh, advertising sense. Um, but to me, it's much more personal than you know trying to sell uh, a product or an image. To me, it's about a form of expression, uh, but in a very subtle way. Mm -hmm. um, I could be obvious um, by saying, you know, buy this product, or this is how I'm feeling, but <coughs> there's no connection made, and it has mm -hmm. to be within the reader of the image uh, for that connection to be made, so you have to be subtle about mm -hmm. all the decisions that you make, and uh, that's why, I mean, I'm not a very decisive person usually, <laughs> um, but when it comes to um, photography, I like minimalism a lot because you just have to be so concrete about each uh, decision that you place inside that image. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why I like still life so much mm -hmm. uh, in studio work, uh, just because there's so much control, manipulation, uh, and freedom of expression. Good. No. I like still yeah. learning and developing our right. Whoever wants to show work first, or we could just. So I get to go first. Yes. Okay. Good. How should I Wait. lay it out? And lay it out on the table. Uh, yeah, I can look at it individually. I mean, I because I. Can. I will do whatever you want. You know. All right. Let me look at it. Are are most of you um, doing digital prints, or the, or also? Analog work or older alternative processes in the dark room? Um, I think probably the majority of us, majority of us have probably brought in digital prints, mm -hmm. but uh, a lot of us also still use film and not necessarily digital camera. Right. So mm -hmm. um, I guess right now we've been, uh, there's other classes that help us hone in on dark room work. We're just starting alternative processes, but I think largely the majority of us, I mean, unless I'm wrong, have gotten pretty comfortable with digital printing right. right now. I do. Well, of course, you can do so much in the computer. I think there is some benefit, and I think Eduardo told me that you still have a wet dark printer. Um, uh, old buildings and new buildings play with each other. I like to do that stuff in my work. Mm -hmm. And just looking at the whole thing in this letter. And this is obviously a different story. And what about these three? Um, it's just kind of my more recent stuff. Mm -hmm. um, doing more studio stuff. Um, I've recently still life. I never really thought I'd get into that. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually kind of enjoy it. <laughs> and still life is really is beautiful. It has yeah. a long history. Um, well, so which of these three bodies uh, of work are you most interested in now and why? Um, probably the architecture um, is what I would like to pursue more. Mm -hmm. um, I love like studio or um, kind of fashion mm -hmm. kind of thing, but I recently kind of figured out that that's not what I want to do for. Um, so I think I want to pursue architecture, but it's definitely something I still want to do. Yeah, but you see, um, actually, I usually work with portraiture. Mm -hmm. uh, this is kind of tomorrow's encouragement because you were talking a lot about lighting. So I decided to be a little bit more experimental and get out of the comfort zone. So I just go out wherever I can, just with a handheld, just kind of paint on mm -hmm. And um, what do you do? 
own development as an artist, and maybe also as a human being, not development, but the um, evolution as a human being, that um, you would have probably an exciting time pushing yourself. Flowers are not always happy. No, they're not. And they're not always used for happy occasions. And right. they're as much about death as they are about life and about the transitory and ephemeral nature of being and existence. So, um, you know, I mean, one thing you do is to set this, this series of kind of projects for yourself of looking at flowers two or three different ways. And how you would go about and then doing that. And then try that. And uh, you know, there have been really beautiful and very moving series on dead flowers. Um, dead flowers, of course, have their own life. But I think um, the challenge is, is to get your personal interpretation and get over the look of the catalog.
Okay. Well, we can set this aside. We talked about this very much in the past. It's, I can, I'll be honest, the best way I can maybe make some, say something that will make sense to you is for me to understand what you are thinking about in this work. And so, you know, when you say, well, now there's this one. That doesn't, that doesn't help me get at what might be of use to you. Um, you took more a lot about decontextualizing like what I was doing. Because there's a lot of deliberate actions on my part to make something and then photograph it. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted something that was had a lot to do with bright colors and things that I made. Right. Which the things that I made didn't really have a purpose mm -hmm. other than to be so far. Yeah. So which of these and the, all right, I'll solve this for you one for hours. I can explain why. So then I want you to work with me to show me um, not sort of the Um So, uh, but which ones do you like? <coughs> this, you know, I like this very much. They find this getting the sort of, you would say in Spanish, cargado. It has too much, too many things. Um, and I sort of, I find this an interesting thing. I'm not sure it works so well with the other. Anyway, so which are your favorite images? Um, well, or do you like any of them? Yeah, I really like the ones that compared to this one. <laughs> and, and mm -hmm. this is, I agree with you. Did you put the shells there? Well, this is probably the most sophisticated, I mean, from my point of view, the most sophisticated image here. I don't see so much see its visual relationship with these two. Um, and the reason, to me, it doesn't, it seems uh, different, is that, in a sense, when I read these images, they're more about um, color, and you know, the movement of life into something. But this is about construction and the imposition and the intervention of the artist or the photographer on some on you know on something outside the, the camera. So I think it's, so why didn't you do more like this? Well I mean that's like the only black and white one and I think Well that now that I can see. The, the, I, I just don't think I'm old enough for black and white. I don't think I understand it quite enough. And I would like to do more like natural construction outside in black and white. It's just I don't think I, I have that understanding yet because I'm so attracted to color right now. So that's, I think that's a very meaningful thing. But you could try using it. Yeah, I mean, I do. I do still shoot in black and white. It's just like I, I feel like I would be stronger. How are you going to develop a longer relationship with it if you don't do it? I mean, I do. I, I have. I, I do still develop black and white. It's just like I'm not happy with how, how it looks right now. What if you said that, but you like this one? Why? I think you should do more in black and white. More in black and white. Or you could do it in color at the same time. You, all right, let's do this. Okay. Don't feel the editing process is completely done on them. I'd like to make them more uh, in unison with each other. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have, I plan on going in a larger format. 
this was just her But the project was one of the Eduardo's class called Early Museums. Mm -hmm. And basically a lot of my work is, uh, I'm, well in this I was exploring urban of course, but I am trying to find the relation in how nature and urban landscapes fit together. Especially mm -hmm. now uh, with the just more construction and less land And so, uh, overall, yeah, I'd say my photography was more about change than anything. Mm -hmm. And um, which do you think, in terms of what you just described, which images best uh, reflect that? Um, Say lighting. Um, oh well, I did. How would you use lighting? But uh, um, you can use natural lighting at various times of the day, or as long. Again, I'm thinking of the analog picture, but with exposures that change the nature of the lighting. Or, um, I mean, there are many ways to use lighting, natural light as natural light. That. I'm not talking about artificial but yeah, I think um, one of the difficulties in achieving what I think you want to achieve is that pictures, you know, like this, are just they're very graphic pictures mm -hmm. um, about a city, and they're not, and it looks more like a graphic representation of kind of shapes and lines of architecture yeah. versus what's really what you you're talking about in terms of urban development. Yeah. And and it's very and with this approach it's hard uh, it's hard to I think say what you want to say. Yeah I don't think I'm I don't think I'm talking about it it's different I think I'm more, right now, describing what I'd like to do versus this 
you know, it's, it's the antithesis of any kind of experience of nature, of course, and yet it's supposed to be that. So maybe you have inside you this very ironic sense of this, in the same with that here is this very kind of formal, almost, it looks like immutable setting, and then, well, we'll customize it, we'll do it, and take it all apart for you. It's just, um, anyway, that's what I find interesting.